at this point, I'm going to return it over to Janine Aquino, who's going to tell you more about what she does and take your questions. Janine. And you're muted. I'm muted. <laughs> Drag it. There we there go. You go. <laughs> Hi, everybody. <laughs> As Tim said, my name is Janine, and I'm a software engineer here at the National Center for Atmospheric Research in Boulder. Um, I'm going to share my screen here. There we go. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the airplanes that we fly around as mobile laboratories to do our research in. Um, but before I do that, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about me. Let's see if my down arrow works. Hello, which way did it go? Oh, is it timed? We'll see. So first a little bit about me. Um, I've been at NCAR for about 30 years. I've been in all kinds of divisions. There's a lot of acronyms there. It's High Altitude Observatory, which studies the sun, the Mesoscale, Microscale, and Meteorology Division, which studies clouds, Joint Office for Science Support, which helps field projects, and now the Earth Observing Lab. And I started as a student, and I kind of worked my way up and ended out as a software engineer. Uh, that picture in the upper right is me back when I started 30 years ago. So when I'm not at work, um, I have two daughters and a husband there on the right. And I wanna point out my husband who's looking off to the side, we were taking a funny picture for his brother, but uh, you see he's kind of a bearded guy with plaid. That's gonna become relevant at the end of my talk. So remember that. We have a couple cats. I like to work in the garden. Um, about a year and a half ago, I started learning to make sourdough bread. So that's kind of a fun hobby. And once a year, NCAR does our outreach event in Boulder called Super Science Saturday, and I've been working with Tim for uh, 25 years, maybe, something like that, doing that yeah. task. Yeah. So if you're local, you can look that up. Um, we have fun creating different types of outreach activities for everybody on that. So why is software engineering important in science? Well, way back, you can imagine long, long ago before computers, people used lab notebooks. This is just a page from Galileo's journal, but you could think of anything else, right? You write down the notes, you write down the data, you analyze the data, it's all in a book. Nowadays, everything is on a computer. So we have to get all that information into a computer. Most of the instruments, the scientific instruments, put their data right onto a computer to start with. We do analysis on a computer, we write papers on a computer. So all of that is facilitated by software engineers. So I put my face on Dilbert there. You can see that's my job in the middle of helping us get all that stuff into the computers. Um, and I kind of think of us as a little bit of superheroes because nothing would happen without us. You don't buy your gas without a computer. You don't, like everything we do. And you might think that being a superhero is maybe a little over the top for somebody who's just a software engineer. So I'll give you this picture. Okay, just kidding. You can see there, there's the little uh, support that's holding the truck up. It's not actually me. Um, but this shows that I do get to travel all over the world with the work that I do, which is pretty fun. This picture was taken in France. Um, that truck is a mobile weather radar truck, so it's got a radar on the back of it. We were studying how mountains affect rain formation, um, and I got to help run that radar and work on that, so that was a lot of fun. But mostly, I work with the two aircraft that we have here at NCAR. So we have a Gulfstream 5 jet, which is the one here in the upper left. And in the lower right, a C-130 cargo plane. And we have totally gutted those from what they would normally look like and filled them up. So as an example, oh, I gotta get, there we go. So on the bottom here, you can see maybe if you were a CEO or a rock star or a sports figure, this is what your Gulfstream 5 would look like. You'd have fancy chairs and tables and maybe somebody to wait on you. But in the upper right, this is what our Gulfstream 5 looks like. So we have taken out all that fun stuff. You can see a little bit of the crazy wallpaper we left up, no reason to remove it, but we put in these metal racks and we fill them up with computers and instruments. We've got other instruments that maybe go along the side here and we fly around through all different kinds of weather and do all kinds of research. Um, on the outside of the plane, we'll have inlets. So these will be different ways of getting data into the instrumentation inside the plane. So this one here has a little laser that goes on it and as the airflow comes along, 
cloud particles can go through that and we can get little images of what those particles look like and learn about the clouds. This one pulls in some air. There's other ones I'm not exactly sure what they do, but we have all kinds of um, both measurements that happen in place and measurements that happen um, remotely, like looking out away from the plane. And this picture at the top is these little icons are kind of some of the places we've been all over the world. So this is a video from the camera that points out the front of our plane. And we use this to kind of have situational awareness to know where we are, and are we in a cloud, not in a cloud, helps the scientists decide um, where to fly. So even in, during a flight, this is putting out one image every second. This is actually sped up 15 times as fast. This is a lot faster than we normally fly, but it gives you an idea. Um, and I'm not gonna play the whole thing because it's 15 minutes long, but if I go down to the middle here, you can see we got down below the cloud deck and we're flying real low over the ocean. So, let's see if I can, there we go. The reason I bring that up is because I want to talk to you about this instrument. This instrument is called, and, I'm sorry? Janine, could I interrupt a second? Absolutely. We just had a question about the difference between the planes. Do you use, and the question is, do you use the cargo plane in heavy weather and the jet in not as bad weather, or do you use both at the same time? Um, do we, we I, I would imagine we vary, it varies depending on the, the uh, field project? Yes. So, um, the primary difference between them is that the C-130 can fly low and slow for long periods of time. The jet is much better high up in the atmosphere, flying, and so it can fly really far, really fast. So if we want to cover a big area from higher up, we primarily do that with um, the G-5. In spite of the fact that I showed you us flying low over the water there in that one, we only spent a little time doing that mostly we would be high up or we would do what we call profiles going down and up and down and up. If we um, stay low for too long, we run through fuel really fast. And we also go really fast low, which can make it harder to get the data we need. So using the C-130 to go slower, lower works out really well. Um, as far as at the same time, we have a limited number of pilots. So generally it's one or the other. Any other questions or shall I continue? You, you can go right ahead, no more questions yet. Okay, so I'm gonna start this video. This is our giant nuclei impactor. This is the one of the instruments that I got to work on recently. Um, the instrument scientist, his name is Jan, he envisioned this and developed it and I got to help write the software that controls it. So what this instrument does is like a little robot and it has an arm that holds a little slide and you'll see in a minute the carousel that those come from. But when he pushes a button, that slide can go down and go out the bottom of the airplane into the airstream and sea salt particles can impact on that. They smash into it and stick and then we take that back to the lab and do analysis on it. So this is a carousel that can hold 30, well, what to see, eight times four, 32 slides and there's these robotic arm and when it pulls the pin, that will cause the little arm that you saw the close up with before to pick up the slide and send it outside the plane. I think this will jump to our pretend outside. We're actually in a lab. So you will see us sitting on a trash can, but you can imagine this bottom of the plane, this stuff here would be on the plane and here's a little slide and we're flying along and the air hits it. Jan can decide how long he wants that exposed and uh, depending on the research he's doing and how many particles there are, so he can optimize that and then he can send it back in. And he can do all of this from his favorite spot, which is a coffee shop. So that's where he <laughs> prefers to be during a flight. He will get himself a coffee, sit down with his computer. And while the plane is flying, pretty much could be anywhere in the world, he can be sitting in his coffee shop and telling it, send the next slide, bring it back. Um, and that interface is what I got to help develop, which was pretty fun. Um, yeah, so any questions about this instrument at this point? None so far. We can, I think we can keep moving on. Okay. So, um, yeah, it's been pretty fun. Let me, I think I'll go ahead. It kind of gets a little repetitive here in this, so I think I'll continue. So this is what, this is going to be a video. This is what a close-up under a microscope of one of those slides look like. And these are all these little 
bits of sea salt and other things that impacted on the slide while we were flying. And the next thing that Jan does is put them into a machine in his lab into an environment where he can, it's high humidity and he can rehydrate them and little cloud droplets grow on this. And this gives him a way to figure out the size distribution of cloud particles that are in that area. And he does research with that. And I'm not gonna go into the type of research he does because frankly, I don't know that much about it. That's outside of my area of expertise. But I had a lot of fun, fun helping him to develop the interface to allow him to control this while we're flying and to collect the data. Um, so in, in effect, are we can, in effect, are we kind of looking at if we could see cloud droplets growing, this might yes. be a representation of that? Oh. Yeah, so in a real cloud, you have little particles that the of whatever could be pollution, could be sea salt up in the air and that's the water tends to collect on that it sticks to it and the more sticks to it and you might get bigger or smaller particles based in you know cloud particles based on how much that little core piece is Excellent. so we work hard when we're in the field um, we work about six days a week some of our days are very long but one day a week we get to uh, have a day off and we always take full advantage of that. So here's some pictures of some of the fun stuff I get to do in the field. Um, starting here in the upper right, these are king penguins when we were down on the southern tip of Chile studying the Southern Ocean. So we got to go see those one day. This is a fur seal pup that was in a stream that we got to go see, and I'll tell you more about that in a minute. This is one of my colleagues, Jim Moore, holding a meerkat. When you're in Australia, the zoos actually let you hold some of the animals, which is something we don't do here in the US, but it was pretty fun. And this picture in the middle here was a field project that I was on that we actually had enough ladies in the field at the same time to go do a wine tasting, which was ton, tons of fun. Um, typically, not always, but typically, the guys are more interested in going out for beer, and often there's only one or two women along, and so we will uh, go along with them, but we had kind of a quorum and we thought we'd take advantage and go have a little girl fun and do a wine tasting. And this is my daughter, my other daughter that wasn't in the first picture. She was lucky enough to come along because she graduated from college and her grandparents paid for her plane flight down to come spend a month with me. So science is kind of a family affair then. She, yeah, that was a lot of fun. I really enjoyed having her along for that. She got to see a new place. We were in Tasmania. And uh, I got to have some company from family because we're out in the field for a month at a time and you can get a little homesick. So it was very nice to have her there. And so I these think are I see a couple of scientists in there. Yeah, oh, there you go. Yeah, there you go. So this is Cindy and Julie and Christina. They're scientists. This is Jody. She's an IT professional. She keeps all of our computers running when we're out in the field. And then me, I support the network on the airplane and also help develop all this code. Um, so one last thing, a little fun video to show you, and this is what circles back to my husband. So I went to this pool at the bottom of a waterfall and watched these little seal puffs cavorting at the bottom of the waterfall. And I called my husband from New Zealand and I said, oh my gosh, you're not going to believe how cute these are. And he kind of went, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're a girl, you're just getting overexcited. Well, he joined me at the end of my project. He came down and saw these and he cooed just like I had. He was gushing over the cuteness of these little football sized seal pups cavorting in the bottom of a waterfall. So I thought that was pretty fun. So that's my presentation. Um, I will stop sharing. You can see if there's questions. Yes, the questions are coming in. Just Janine, just, just so you know, the, the link to your presentation uh, on our webpage was broken, but it's fixed. So we do have people who've just joined us. Okay. And they, they may ask questions. You may think, didn't I talk about that? And it's just they're trying to catch up on uh, some of what you've mentioned. But we do have some questions already. And uh, one of those questions was, what happens with the data once you collect it? So in the case of this specific instrument that I just talked to you about, he gets those slides and in the field, he puts them in a little tube with some desiccant, which is something that dries stuff out. You've maybe seen it, little packets and things you bought from the store or whatever. So he does that, he takes them home, you know, packs them all up, brings them back to Colorado, and then he goes into the lab 
rehydrates and takes pictures of those, makes those videos, and then also um, collects statistics and does his analysis. Other data that we collect, all different forms, but it's usually in some kind of a digital form on a computer. Some aren't like that. They have to, it takes a little while to get into digital form. It all goes into our archive, our data archive here at NCAR in Boulder. And that's really what the National Science Foundation pays us to create, right? We can go fly around, but it's not really helpful unless we have this collection of data that scientists can use to do research, to study the atmosphere, weather, all kinds of things. We do have another question. What is your favorite part of your job? And what was your favorite field campaign that you supported? So my favorite part of my job is that it's always changing. I always get to learn something new. I go to different places. I work with scientists doing different types of science and I get to learn a little bit about, in this case, sea salt particles, or in another case, hurricanes, or how rain forms over mountains. So it's just, there's always something new to learn. And that's a lot of fun. Um, I have to say that the field project that my daughter got to come along on was quite a bit of fun. It was really fun to have her there and have adventures with her on my down day. So um, yeah, maybe that would be my top one. It's hard to choose because I've been to so many neat places. That sounds wonderful. And we did have a question that you can relate to, I'm sure. How much of your job is troubleshooting broken code? So that depends on how well I do my job, right? If I write good, robust code with lots of checks in it and testing, hopefully I don't have to troubleshoot it too much when I'm in the field. That said, things break. And one of the uh, challenges of being in the field is we are taking sensitive scientific equipment, sticking it on a plane, we're flying it from where it's low down and it might be really hot and humid, and then the plane goes really high where it's very cold and dry. And as you can imagine, electronics don't really love all that changing back and forth. So things break. Sometimes it's the hardware, sometimes it's the software. And we have to kind of spend a lot of time figuring out what went wrong and replacing things. It's a harsh environment to try to do science in. It's not like a controlled lab. Uh, we have another question about your data. Uh, what kinds of research reports have used your data? So tons of them. We have lists and lists of publications, hundreds and hundreds, um, and it just depends on the project. So we had a hurricane project and lots of papers, peer-reviewed publications by scientists on how to, you know, how to hurricanes form came out of that. And then we had a wildfire experiment and that was all about what kind of pollution does do wildfires put up into the air and how does that affect the weather downstream? And there's a bunch of publications coming out about that. So it's very dependent on the goals of the scientists who requested the project and what they're trying to learn. That's interesting. Um, waiting for some more questions coming in. And we have one question, I'm not sure if it's for you or for someone in the chat it was about which state in the US has the most air pollution? Have you had any answer to that one? Yeah, I actually don't know about that in the US. I know that Mexico City happens to be really, really polluted. We did a study there one year and it's kind of in a valley. And so all that pollution kind of gets trapped by the mountains all around it. And it's a very, very polluted location. Okay. Uh, we do have a question that's definitely for you. How did you decide this would be your job? Oh gosh, well, I kind of didn't. I made plans and then life happened, which happens to a lot of us, right? So when I was young, we would go camping. I would lay out in a sleeping bag under the stars and I was like, I'm gonna be an astronomer. That's totally fun, I love that. Then um, I kind of came to realize, which I knew all that along, but hadn't really thought about it, I'm a morning person. I do not do well sleep deprived. I don't like to be up all night long. That was a bad idea. <laughs> but I got a job working with the high altitude observatory that I mentioned in the beginning and they study the sun. There's your star that's up during the day. So that worked out pretty well. I got to do that for a while. Then that job ended. My advisor actually left and went back to Europe. And I found another job working with a cloud physicist and kind of got more involved in that side of the science and learned more and more about computers and eventually ended out where I am. But it's just kind of evolved. There's a, another question for you. Do you, do you like, do you like flying at high altitude? And have you, 
Have you done that before, flying at high altitude, maybe in the G5? So the G5 kind of goes up about where an airliner would fly, a commercial airliner. So if you've ever taken a flight anywhere, you're somewhere in that area. We go a little higher, but not too bad. Um, it's real smooth. It's real easy to fly in. We don't need oxygen or anything other than just the pressurization of the airplane cabin like you would in a commercial flight. I actually don't prefer to spend my time in a plane. I'd much rather be able to get up and walk around and take a break. So um, I work pretty hard on that part of the code that lets us control it from the ground in the coffee shop. That's where I'd prefer to be here. There were times, uh, the last project I was in, it was very strange in Costa Rica, our hotel rooms had um, hammocks. So some of the flights, I got to watch them while laying in a hammock. That was pretty fun. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like you prefer to be on the ground if you can. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, what's the most difficult part of your job someone wants to know? The most difficult part um, is when I don't know what's going wrong. And that can be very stressful. So I had one project where um, computers always, your computer at home always has a time on it. And all of a sudden we get time from satellites on our airplane and all of a sudden the time we were getting from the satellite said it was 1970. And that was not, <laughs> it was not 1970. And we did not know why, we didn't know if something was wrong with how we were connecting to the satellite. And I spent a full day with a bunch of my coworkers trying to figure out the problem. And I have a picture of that that somebody took and I look pretty stressed out. But at the end of the day, we stopped, we were like, okay, we're gonna have dinner, we gotta close up for the day, take a break, come back to it tomorrow. And after dinner, I went back to my hotel room and I went back to the website of the satellite provider to see what was going, you know, if there's any information that would help me figure this out. And they put a big red banner across the top saying that they had a problem. It wasn't me after all, just had to wait. Huge sigh of relief, wait for them to fix it. We were good to go. But in the meantime, that was very stressful. I can imagine. Uh, we had another question come in and it reads, is it difficult to be a female in a male dominated career? It can be, right? There's a there's a cultural difference, I think, sometimes, especially when you're traveling in foreign countries on what the women would like to do maybe with their down day versus the men. So it's always great when there's other women around. Um, just to have that companionship and somebody who maybe thinks, you know, sees something different, has the same interest as me, whatever, wants to do the same things I want to do. But yeah, there's good sides and there's bad sides. It's definitely something to navigate. And I have a question about your next project. Do you know what your next, uh, I hope you know what your next project is going to be, but it might be that everything is on hold. Uh, everything is pandemic. on hold, yes. Mm. So we had quite a few projects that were supposed to happen this summer that are now canceled, well, postponed, not canceled permanently. Um, the next big project that should it happen will happen in the summer of 2021 is to Japan. So that will be the next place I get to go. Um, we also have some local projects where we study things right here out of Colorado out of the airport that our planes are at. So sometimes certain weather phenomena we can study right from here. So maybe those will be easier to do and hopefully some of those will happen. Um, but I'm not exactly sure. We're all waiting to see how all this whole situation evolves and what our next project is. And so in the meantime, what, what do you do while you're waiting for the, find out if the, can, the pro pro projects are gonna start again? Well, like I said with that, um, giant nuclei impactor. I spent a lot of time developing that code. That happens in the office or currently at home. So I'm currently working with a scientist on a microwave temperature profiler. So what this is, is an instrument that takes a, like a scan of a vertical profile of the temperature. So temperature higher, temperature lower, like a whole spectrum through the sky of what all the temperatures are. And it does this using microwaves, hence its name. But we have to have code to run that. So um, I've been working on developing that. We have some really old code and we're modernizing it and making it more efficient. And I've been spending a lot of time on that development with that instrument scientist. All right, well, here we go. We have a young viewer who wants to, he's a big fan of everything Tesla, Tesla Motors. And he wants to know if you think electric cars will take over because of air pollution. I think he's 11, I think he said. Yeah, you know, I hope that we have more electric cars. I really do. I think that that would help a lot with pollution. 
That said, it's interesting with all of us staying at home, we've been driving a lot less. And with a lot less cars on the road and a lot less pollution from cars, we still haven't solved everything. So there's other pieces of the puzzle that are important. Excellent. I think we've gotten all the questions. We'll wait just a couple of seconds and see if we get any more. And then I think we'll end this session. And so that everyone knows we have been recording. And if you did come in late, uh, from the same page where our virtual visits are posted, there will be a link to the video, a video of what we just did there. And you can link on it to catch the beginning of uh, Janine's uh, presentation. And I see a thank you has already come in <laughs> for Janine. And with that, I think I'd like to also thank Janine and let you know I will be posting in the chat a link to our uh, website. And you can go there to catch uh, the video. And you can also look at the schedule of the next presentations we'll have. Is there any last things you'd like to leave our viewers with, Janine? Thanks so much for all the great questions. It was fun. Um, I can admit I accidentally ended up with a couple plants in the crowd, people who know me. That was great. So I really appreciated <laughs> the support. And uh, yeah, thanks for joining us. This was a lot of fun. All right. Thanks, everyone. And again, I just posted that link in the chat, and I'll also post a link to our Earth Observing Laboratory. We can see some of the other field campaigns, and as Janine said, they're postponed for right now, but you can get a look and see what we might be doing in the future. We'll hopefully see you all again next week. Thank you. Bye now. Bye.